Excellent. All right, just give it a moment so we can uh, let everybody in here. Looks like we have uh, 36 attendees in. Excellent. 36 classrooms. Wonderful. Allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dorian. I am a historical interpreter with the California State Park System. And I am broadcasting from a very special historical district, historical park uh, called Colonel Allen's State Historic Park. It's located in the southern part of the Central Valley, Tulare County, California. And it's a very, very interesting and important historical site that the uh, state park system administers. Um, many of you probably know there's a lot of different types of parks within the California state system. You have uh, beach parks, mountain parks, you have um, uh, lake parks. We have an island park, Angel Island. That was the last state park that I worked at. And actually, a uh, state park where Colonel Allensworth actually lived uh, when he was stationed there with the men that he led, the uh, Buffalo Soldiers, who I'm going to be speaking about today have river parks, desert parks, all sorts of different recreational uh, opportunities available within the California state system. Uh, welcome, everyone. But uh, yeah, let, let me just get started seeing all the, the waves. Ah, excellent, excellent. That's wonderful, wonderful to have you all here with me today. Um, I understand we've been dealing with a lot of different strange weather phenomena all over the state recently and the atmospheric rivers and uh and we power outages and everything like that so i'm glad that we've had all the technical difficulties uh worked out before this presentation could begin because we've been uh we had a power outage here as well but um see somebody has a raised hand there excellent allow me just to uh get started here But Allensworth is a very fascinating place. The, the point of a uh, state historic park or a historical district is almost to recreate what life would have been like for a, during a different period of time. In the case of Allensworth, we go back to the year 1908, uh, the year the township was founded by the, uh, by the gentleman that's portrayed in the illustration standing directly behind me, Lieutenant Colonel Allen Allensworth, who was the leader of the Buffalo Soldiers, we're actually among the first park rangers here in California. So a uh, very interesting and important period of state and national history. We talk about most of the buildings here are total reconstructions. I'm standing in the old schoolhouse, which was built in 1912. This happens to be one of the original structures here in the historic district. But, uh, but the period of time that we talk about is between 1908 and roughly 1918. The first 10 years, the heyday of the community that was founded here by Alan Allensworth. But in order to tell his story and the story of the men that he led, you actually have to go back to a much earlier period of time. You have to go back to the American Civil War and you have to go to the years preceding it. Uh, Alan Allensworth was born in 1842 in the state of Kentucky. And he was born into the terrible conditions of slavery, uh, which existed all throughout the American continents. And by the time the American Civil War occurred, it was mostly concentrated in the American South. A terrible institution, in which the enslaved population had been refused basic human rights, such as the ability to get uh, basic education or, or the ability for any form of self-determination and independence. Most of them were for forced to work on the, the big farms, the uh, cotton fields and plantations and sugar cane and tobacco, which dominated the economy of the American South. And the slave masters, political bosses of the American South, they feared that if the enslaved population knew how to read and write, that they might be able to better organize a rebellion against the established authority, and the authority uh, which administered slavery in, in the Southern states. Alan Allensworth had actually taught himself how to read and write. Education was a very important priority of his, uh, and a hallmark of his life and his career. And it was a remarkable feat that he was able to do so, teach himself how to read and write. But as I said, since it was against the law at the time, it was considered unlawful. He, when his masters found out that he knew how to read and write, that he taught himself how to do it, they were enraged. And uh, he was punished. He was actually sold down river, separated from his family, uh, terrible consequence of the, uh, the situation. 
And um, he was put in a situation where he had actually traveled to a number of other states, seen what life was like in other parts of the American South. He'd attempted to escape from slavery a number of times, but he wouldn't be successful until the eruption of the American Civil War. Uh, of course, the American Civil War breaks out technically in 1861, when the southern states such as um, Virginia, North and South Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, Texas, uh, Arkansas, and, and others, um, they basically uh, take up arms and form their own military that's in uh, direct rebellion against the United States. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln is elected president. And the main fear that they had at the time was that he was going to free the slaves. Uh, so they, um, they preemptively attacked a federal fort, uh, Fort Sumter, South Carolina, which begins the official military hostilities of the American Civil War. So they raised their own army. And in response, Lincoln raises his army, the uh, Grand Army of the Republic, which is to march south in order to crush this rebellion. And it turns out, that a section of Lincoln's army, the 44th Illinois Volunteers, are marching through the town where Alan Allensworth is being held as a slave in Louisville, Kentucky. And Allensworth sees the opportunity to finally escape from the bondage of slavery. He sees the army marching through the town, and he falls in line behind the soldiers, basically enters into the American Civil War. Um, he joins the Union military first as a, a volunteer, uh, he's a nurse's aide for the hospital corps. Then, uh, since he, uh, he knows how to read and write, in 1862, he's able to join the Union Navy. He's a uh, steward for the ship. Uh, this proves to be a very invaluable skill. He's the right-hand man of the captain. The river gunboats, which are operating all throughout the American West, uh, the, uh, the Western theater of the, uh, the American Civil War, I should say, and, uh, you know, river, not necessarily the American, but not anywhere near far west is... Uh, you know, Colorado or California or anything like that, but the Western extremities of the, uh, of the fight during the American Civil War. Controlling over the, over the riverways is extremely important during the war. The South is largely a agricultural economy. They don't have a lot of uh, industry or factories or anything like that. Railroads. So they depend on the rivers in order to navigate and transport troops and send communications. So big part of the Union strategy, a big part of the strategy of the forces that remain loyal to the United States and Abraham Lincoln is controlling the waterways, controlling the rivers. And this is the theater that Alan Allen's was operating in during the American Civil War. He's the steward of a ship, meaning he's in charge of supplies, making sure that they, uh, the troops have enough uh, food and provisions, ammunition, uh, materials in order to sustain long uh, campaigns on the riverways and on the, uh, you know, the various waterways that connect the American South. So he serves with distinction, and it happens to be in the year 1863, uh, President Abraham Lincoln signs into law, he proclaims the Emancipation Proclamation, which frees all of the uh, African-American slaves throughout the, uh, throughout the South. Um, and this allows them to join into the Union military. It's called the United States Colored Troops, or USCT. And uh, there would be 200,000 African-American men and, and some women even, uh, mostly d disguised as men, that would fight in this war, essentially fighting for their freedom. This would be the decision that would animate a lot of their, lot of their actions during the war. And uh, Alan Allen's work would be part of that legacy. And the Buffalo soldiers emerged directly out of that, uh, that legacy. So, so their, their true beginnings go back to the year 1863, when the war officially, the, the North's war effort, part of it became not just about preserving the Union, but ending the institution of slavery as it had existed in the United States up to that point. So Allen's work serves with distinction in the Union Navy during the war. And by 1865, the Union has basically defeated this Confederate rebellion in the South. And uh, the slaves are freed from the uh, institution of slavery as it had existed before. In response to this, federal government sets up a new agency called the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, the Bureau is a very interesting uh, government agency. 
Uh, they administer a number of programs uh, that are designed to, ins uh, to assist the, uh, the emancipated or the freed uh, slaves after in the final year of the Civil War and uh, in, in the years following the Civil War. Um, this is a very important institution. It's basically one of, their, one of their main goals is to reunite families that have been separated as a result of the Civil War. The Civil War is a, a terrible war. Whole towns are destroyed. Um, it's, it's very brutal in the sense that there's devastation all across the countryside. Uh, farms and homes where people lived their entire lives were destroyed and families separated in the chaos of the war. Freedmen's Bureau sets up a system of centers, uh, stations where people can report, and they set up a system of records where families can look for uh, relatives that they've been separated from. It also sets up a system of basic refugee camps where uh, refugees could obtain basic assistance, such as uh, food, provisions, clothing. They could get rations and medical treatment. It sets up a system of hospitals all throughout the American South. Probably not too dissimilar from some of the hospitals that Allensworth had worked in when he initially joined the Union war effort. It also sets up the very first system of public schools throughout the American South. And this would be uh, an opportunity for Allensworth because after he's finished with his service with the Union Navy, he decides to put himself through one of the Freedmen's uh, Bureau schools, the Eli Normal School, where he's able to obtain a degree that allows him to, uh, to become a teacher and an agent for the, the Freedmen's Bureau. So he travels all throughout the uh, American South. And back to his home state of Kentucky as well, where he's uh, where he's basically able to teach people, teach the freedmen and their families how to read and write, how to do basic arithmetic, how to how to obtain an education that had been totally denied them in the years before the American Civil War. And the Freedmen's Bureau set up uh, K through 12 schools, what we would call elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools, but it also set up a system of colleges some of which are still in operation today. So the Freedmen's Bureau, arguably one of their, uh, their most lasting impacts, the legacies of the Freedmen's Bureau that came out of the American Civil War was the system of schools that they set up. And a lot of historically black colleges and universities such as Howard University in Washington, DC, which is named after General Howard who was a commissioner for the Bureau. Um, a lot of them are still in operation to the present day. So that's definitely a, a big part of Allensworth's uh, uh, service to uh, to his people and to his country, and it's an extension of the American Civil War. The Freedmen's Bureau had been run by the Union Army, and it was designed, uh, it basically opened operations at the very last year of the Civil War in 1865, but it would continue into 1872. So in different parts of the country, it had different functions, but the education was kind of a consistent theme with the Bureau. And he... Um, in the years after the Freedmen's Bureau is dissolved in 1872, Allensworth uh, endeavored to continue his work in the field of education. A lot of the schools that were set up by the Freedmen's Bureau continued to operate, but outside being run by uh, the federal government, they were run by local churches. And Allensworth would join the Baptist Church. He would continue. He would uh, he would continue his studies in the field of uh, religious scholarship and theology. And he would become an ordained Baptist minister. And his background in the field of education made him uniquely qualified to become a, a, uh, an administrator. He was the uh, superintendent for the Sunday school system that was run by the uh, Baptist church in the state of Kentucky. So in the years following the Civil War, he continues in enhancing his skills in, in, uh, in the field of education to serve his community to serve his people who'd been recently freed from the yoke of slavery. And I wanna talk a little bit more about the uh, American Civil War and talk about the leaders that emerged out of this time period and the men and women who fought during this time period because this is a, it's an extremely part, important part of history that has largely been uh, overlooked and neglected or at least up until recently had been. And, uh, we're trying to uh, reverse course on that here because this is uh, this is very important and, and and really fascinating history that I think everybody should know about. Let me see here. I want to make sure everybody can 
Am I sharing screen here? Give me a thumbs up if uh, you can see. Share screen. Okay, there we go. Excellent, thank you. I really appreciate that. So this is a map that I have drawn up of the state of California. And actually, I think this is a good time to basically explain where I am. I'm sure we have viewers from all over the state. But Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park is down at the very kind of the southern end of the uh, Central Valley. Of course, the Central Valley does extend further past Allensworth. We're about an hour drive north of the city of Bakersfield. But the Central Valley stretches all throughout the interior of the state of California. And uh, up here to the north, you can see the Presidio of San Francisco. The Buffalo Soldiers have been there. You see Camp Reynolds, Angel Island, another beautiful state park right in the middle of San Francisco Bay. The Buffalo Soldiers were garrisoned there. And at the time, Alan Allensworth lived there. I'm going to talk about that towards the end of the presentation. Presidio Monterey. And then, of course, you have Yosemite and Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. Which ultimately, the Buffalo Soldiers would wind up there operating as a mine. The, uh, the first park rangers in the state of California, but we've got a lot of history to cover before we get up to that point. Anyhow, yeah, these are some, some images just to give you a general idea of what Allensworth looks like. You can see this map here that I've drawn of the, it's basically a bird's eye view of uh, Allensworth, the town side where the park is, basically surrounded by flat land as far as you can see. And it's mostly farming fields, agriculture. Uh, Central Valley is extremely important. Uh, about 25% of the nation's food supply, in one way or another, can be traced back to the great Central Valley of California, of which Allensworth is part. But we'll get back to this map later. Normally, I do these broadcasts from the, well, I mean, I've done broadcasts from the hotel, but the internet connection there is sometimes a little bit unstable. So instead, I'm from the schoolhouse here. I'm going to show you uh, around the schoolhouse in a little bit. But going back to the American Civil War, as I'd mentioned earlier, there were 200,000 African-American soldiers who served in the Union Army and in the Union Navy during the war, uh, essentially uh, fighting for their freedom against the uh, Confederate rebellion, which, uh, which had been formed in order to preserve the institution of slavery. Here you see a painting of one of the most famous battles that African-American troops, uh, well, one of the first battles that they fought in during the American Civil War. You see the charge on Fort Wagner. It's actually depicted uh, in a very historically accurate uh, film called Glory. Uh, it's one of the final scenes in the movie. I don't want to give away too much. Those of you that are in elementary school, you'll probably be watching this film as your studies advance once you get into high school. But it's, an, it's just a spectacular film starring uh, Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington. And it depicts as one of the major events during the... Uh, uh, during the film, the charge against the Confederate Fort, uh, Fort Wagner along the Carolina coast. And it was, uh, it was a brutal battle, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, they, they were not successful in the initial charge and sustained uh, heavy casualties. But because of their heroic charge, the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, one of the first of the all-Black regiments of the uh, Union Army, uh, um, they achieved the status of uh, basically national heroes, and they became very inspiring for African-Americans wanting to join into the fight for their freedom during the American Civil War. And these are uh, depictions from different periods of time, murals from the Great Depression era, and depictions of the soldiers wearing the Union blue. For those of you uh, in elementary school who haven't gotten to the Civil War yet, uh, one of the things to remember is that the soldiers wearing the blue uniforms are the ones that are uh, uh, they're loyal to the United States, and the soldiers wearing the gray uniforms are part of the Confederate rebellion, uh, which is mostly uh, from the American South. So it's a very interesting period of time. As a number of African American leaders rise up during this time period, one of the uh, one of the most interesting, in my opinion, is the great uh, Major Martin Delaney. Who'd been born a freedman, but had advocated. He was an abolitionist. He was he was advocating for the end of slavery. And he became a political leader. He was a medical doctor. He's actually a Harvard-educated doctor. 
and became a, a major recruiter and leader for the United States Colored Troops or USCT, who would ultimately would later become the Buffalo Soldiers. So he was, uh, and in a lot of ways, he's kind of the intellectual forefather of Allen. He's all about self determination, winning independence, uh, you know, through uh, through through any number of different means. But as far as the Civil War is concerned, he said that it's it, it's his top priority to fight for freedom, and that's exactly the uh, the rationale that many of the African American soldiers, such as the uh, famous fifty fourth. Massachusetts volunteers. That's what a lot of them have in mind when they volunteer to uh, to join into the fight during the American Civil War, fighting for their freedom and for the freedom of their family members, many of whom were still being held in slavery in the American South. This is actually a monument to the 54th Massachusetts in in Boston, Massachusetts, and it's uh, it's really interesting some of the ways that uh, the, the war is depicted in uh, various public monuments. But you see, Colonel Shaw who'd been the, uh, the leader of the, uh, he'd been the commanding officer, I should say, of the uh, of 50, 54th Massachusetts on horseback. And then, of course, the African-American uh, uh, infantrymen, infantry being foot soldiers, marching afoot, being led by Lady Liberty to freedom and to glory, which is what the, uh, that film that I was referencing is about. And other African-American leaders during the American Civil War uh, that I would like to mention here have Robert Smalls here to the to my left, and he's just a fascinating figure too. Uh, a lot a lot of these uh, a lot of these men's stories are kind of intertwined, but he like Alan Allensworth had been born into slavery, and he was working on the shipyards in Charleston Bay. He was an expert sailor, being forced to work for the Confederate Navy at the time, and he actually he was so skilled of a sailor that he managed to steal a Confederate ship, sailed it across enemy lines and into the hands of the Union, winning not only his freedom, but the freedom of all the men that were being held on board that ship. And he won the status of a hero, a hero not just in the African-American community, but a national hero. And he was, he was made captain of the ship, one of the, along with Martin Delaney, I would say the highest ranking African-American officers during the American Civil War. And after the war was over, he was a huge advocate for the work that the Freedmen's Bureau was doing. He was, uh, many people consider him to be, he was, a, he was elected into Congress. He was a congressman for uh, the state of South Carolina for many years. And he, uh, many people consider him to be the, uh, the godfather of the, uh, of the public education system in South Carolina. Because he was such a huge advocate for public schools after the American Civil War into the period we know as Reconstruction. Of course, in the center here, you see Martin Delaney once again. And to the right, you see uh, Alan Allen's. This is the photograph that the painting standing behind me um, was uh, inspired by, I should say. Um, he is wearing the same kind of uniform that you would see during the American Civil War. Although this uniform, this photo was taken decades after the Civil War had been technically concluded. Uh, these are all black and white photographs, obviously, but these all would be uh, blue uniforms. And this picture was taken in the late 1880s because Allensworth decides to rejoin the, uh, the U.S. military because he, uh, he discovers that the needs, the educational needs of African-Americans extend back into the Army. Uh, a number of uh, African-American regiments stayed in U.S. military service after the Civil War was concluded. And he would basically lobby the government to become the chaplain for one of these all African-American army regiments, specifically the 24th Infantry Regiment, Buffalo Soldiers. And I'll explain who they were as we advance here in, in a moment. But he, um, the chaplain, which was the position that he would be appointed to, would be the combination of being a religious leader, a minister, and spiritual guide for the soldiers, but he would also be a teacher. So as the uh, African-American troops move west, uh, you know, as the Buffalo soldiers move west with the expansion of the United States, Allensworth would establish schools at every fort, at every frontier post that they would go to so that the soldiers and the family, the children of the post would get a basic education. And he served so well in this capacity that he, uh, he reached the rank of lieutenant colonel, the first African-American man to, uh, to do so. Uh, so really a remarkable career I and mean, huge advocate for public education. 
And I should mention that because the building that I'm standing in right now is a schoolhouse that is not too dissimilar from some of the schools that have been put up during the era of the Freedmen's Bureau and, uh, and during his army service. Although I, I would say the schoolhouse I'm in is a little bit nicer. Um, it's uh, more well-funded and it's, uh, it's actually a very beautiful building, but I'm going to talk about that uh, in a little bit here. And here's another illustration of Allensworth. This is actually for a newspaper, uh, the sentiment maker, that was used to uh, recruit people to come out here to the freedom colony that he established. And I'll get into the reasons why the township here at Allensworth was, uh, was built in a moment. But moving on to who the Buffalo soldiers were themselves. These are all army regiments, African-American uh, army regiments, that were formed of soldiers that had fought in the Civil War, Civil War veterans. And they met with a lot of political resistance originally. There were a lot of people in the aftermath of the American Civil War that said that there shouldn't be any, any black soldiers left in the, uh, in the US military. A lot, of, a lot of people viewed it as being very threatening. And, um, but they'd served so valiantly, so heroically during the war that uh, various politicians and generals had, had defended the African-American troops and said that they had earned their place in the, uh, in, in the U.S. military, specifically the U.S. Army. So in 1866, four all African-American regiments, well, actually, it had originally been six, uh, but ultimately four all African-American regiments were, uh, were formed. You have the, the two infantry regiments, which had originally been four regiments, but they have, in the end, they decided on two. Uh, the infantry are basically foot soldiers that march on foot, generally speaking. Of course, there's a, there's a variety of different transportation options for them, but the, uh, you have the 24th and 25th Infantry, and it'd be the 24th Infantry that Allen's would be a part of. And then you have the famous 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments, and the cavalry are the soldiers that are on horseback. Um, so you'll see your schools probably have mascots of different types. I'm not sure about... Uh, all the different schools that are uh, that are in part of this program today. But if you have a mascot such as a tiger or you know a, a horse, a mustang, or something like that, the equivalent that the army has in their heraldry, just like a like a logo or a uh, a uh, a symbol, is the buffalo. And I'll, I'll get into why the buffalo was chosen in just a moment. But the years immediately following the American Civil War, the, uh, most of the army is disbanded. So you see uh, a lot of these soldiers are still wearing basically the same uniforms that they would have worn during the Civil War, still wearing the Union blue. These, uh, of course, you can't tell because it's a black and white photograph, but you'll see there uh, it's basically the dark blue jacket, light blue pants, and different types of headgear that they'd be wearing. And they were sent far and wide all across the American frontier to conclude projects that had begun during the American Civil War. One of the things Abraham Lincoln had commissioned, one of the things that he'd ordered during the American Civil War was the construction of a transcontinental railroad that would connect the eastern part of the country, where the, uh, where the capital is, Washington, D.C., to the western part of the country, where most of us are here today and where I'm broadcasting from in California. A lot of the gold that was being mined during the American Civil War was being used to pay for the war effort. So as I understand about uh, California, despite the fact that there were no major battles that were fought here in the state, uh, California remained loyal to the Union and uh, paid for about a fifth, 20 percent of the war effort through the gold that was being mined here. And that was the point of the railroad that was being constructed to connect the east to the west. The Buffalo soldiers, these African-American troops, would act as a security force, a security police force, to make sure that the construction of the railroad continued and they weren't bothered, uh, the, the, the workers weren't bothered by, uh, by uh, various forces that might want to get in the way of the construction of the railroad. And I'll talk about that uh, as we advance here. But yeah, I can see different illustrations and photographs of the Buffalo soldiers uh, some of them, of course, would ride on horseback. Some of them would march on foot. There was a point where there was a cavalry experiment where they were riding on bicycles once uh, once trails were put down. But, uh, but yeah, they do a lot of work in the national parks, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment here. 
But the Buffalo Soldiers, as you can see here, the I'll talk about the origin of the name Buffalo Soldier. Because one of their first assignments was uh, being sent to the state or the area that we would now call the state of Oklahoma. They were sent to protect uh, Native American reservations and tribes that had been forcibly removed from their homelands in the American South. Various tribes that had originally been from uh, the states of, uh, say, the states of Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, the Carolinas. So you have five tribes, and actually would later be more, that were forcibly removed due to the Indian Removal Act of 1830. You have the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole. They're all forcibly relocated to uh, Oklahoma. And that was the period of time and the event, the tragic event, you know, is the Trail of Tears. And when they settled in Oklahoma, they found themselves being attacked by other Native Americans tribes who were native to that region, tribes such as the Cheyenne. The Buffalo Soldiers ride in to what's now the state of Oklahoma to defend uh, Cherokee reservations from attacks from other Native American tribes. They charge into battle against the Cheyenne, who had, at that up to that point had never seen African American soldiers before. They were so impressed by the fighting spirit of these African American cavalry troops that they compared their fighting spirit to that of the wild buffalo. And uh, as, soon as, the, as soon as the soldiers found out about that, found out that's what they were being called, they took it with such uh, pride that it, uh, that it basically became part of their, the, you know, their regimental flags, their heraldry, so to speak, their, their mascot. There's a number of different stories and theories as to how the name originated, but that's the most consistent one that I've seen in my research up to this point. And you start seeing the name Buffalo Soldier written about in uh, various letters and in the newspapers during that time period in the 1870s and into the 1880s. And these are various paintings. This one's by the great Frederick Remington, who had been a, uh, he'd been an illustrator. He'd been a painter for Harper's Weekly uh, Journal, a Journal of Civilization that had been one of the most famous uh, magazines at the time. So the Buffalo Soldiers were acknowledged to a limited extent during the, their, their famous time period. You can see this is basically a cavalry charge uh, going through the Monument Valley area in uh, Arizona. Mostly stationed, well, really all throughout the American West, but they acted as a security force for the construction of the railroad. They acted as a security force for the uh, transportation of mail the overland uh, mail routes, like the Wells Fargo uh, stagecoaches, various things like that. But they, uh, but they also built, uh, helped build up a lot of the towns, build up a lot of the roads. And hence, Allen's worth every fort frontier position that they went to, he would try to establish a new school so that the uh, Buffalo soldiers could continue their education and uh, continue their path towards uh, independence and self-determination here in the American West which ultimately would lead to the foundation of this town here at Allensburg. These are different artistic representations. This is uh, Frederick Remington there just above. But he did a whole series of illustrations when he was stationed with the Buffalo Soldiers all throughout the uh, American Southwest. So really interesting figure here. But eventually, the Buffalo Soldiers, their path would take them right here to California, where they would serve as a monk. The, uh, the first park rangers in the state. And in order to talk about this, I kind of have to talk a little bit about the history of, of the California state park system itself. And it's really another byproduct of the American Civil War in some respects, because Abraham Lincoln had been given uh, images of what the Yosemite Valley looked like. And he was basically told by conservationists at the time that, uh, you know, big mining companies were coming in, big logging companies were coming into uh, Yosemite and uh, starting to really alter the landscape. Um, by that point in time, all the gold that was easily mineable during the gold rush had long since been accounted for. So uh, mining companies, in order to get to the gold inside of the mountains, and the cliff sides, they were using something called hydraulic mining using massive water cannons to start blasting off the sides of mountains in order to get to the gold within. This leads Abraham Lincoln to uh, basically pr be provoked into action. He signs in the Yosemite and Mariposa Grove land grant, 
which creates the very first uh, state park in California. Believe it or not, Yosemite, now it's a national park, but it was originally a state park. But they didn't have park rangers back in those days. So it was left to the army to come in and basically act as a uh, police force, as wildland firefighters to uh, ensure that there wasn't any illegal grazing, illegal hunting, illegal uh, mining or logging going on inside of any of the, uh, the uh, state and national parks. And that's when the Buffalo Soldiers originally come in. Is uh, well, this is their, their first tour of duty in Yosemite is in 1899. And they come over, and it's not long after that that Allensworth himself would uh, he would be stationed at Angel Island, but he's is serving and leading the troops who would ultimately serve as park rangers in, uh, in Yosemite. And they build up the trails, they build up the roads, some of the trails and highways that are still used to the present day in order to open up public access into the uh, state and national parks. If you go into Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, you'll see the 198 highway. The highway leading into the entrance of the park is called the Charles, the Colonel Charles Young Memorial Highway. And it's called that because the construction of that highway was undertaken by Buffalo soldiers, was built by Buffalo soldiers and some civilian workers. But the work was all overseen by, uh, by the great Charles Young one of the first African-American graduates of West Point, just an outstanding, uh, just a remarkable individual. Um, spoke a number of languages, expert engineer, and he was the first African-American superintendent of a national park. So in the summer of 1903, he supervised the construction of the highway that leads into and through uh, Sequoia National Park, uh, the General's Highway. And because of his service and his duties, at uh, Sequoia National Park. There's actually a, a massive uh, Sequoia tree that bears his name. He's a very humble man too. He didn't, he didn't want a tree to be named after him. He's basically, a lot of the workers that were there, they said, oh, we should name a tree after you. He says, well, well if you still feel that way 20 years from now, uh, you can name the tree after me, but I won't have it named after me while I'm there. That's what he said. But uh, some hundred years later, they finally named and dedicated the tree after him. So it was on the 100th anniversary of the uh, construction of that highway, the 198 highway, that the uh, Colonel Charles Young tree was named. There's also a tree there named after uh, Alan Allen's worst mentor, Booker T. Washington, who was a leading African-American intellectual and uh, one of the founders of the famous Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, which uh, Allensworth wanted to get going here at the community. But uh, in order to explain what Allensworth was, the dream that uh, Colonel Allensworth had for the community here, you really have to go back to the journeys of the Buffalo Soldiers themselves. I mean, the Buffalo Soldiers, they traveled far and wide all throughout the American West, many to other countries. Allensworth had been in the Spanish-American War. He'd been in the Philippines. Some of the Buffalo Soldiers had been in Cuba and Puerto Rico. Some of them had been in other countries. Some of them, Charles Young had been in uh, Africa. He'd been in Liberia, Nigeria. Actually, interestingly enough, um, Martin Delaney, who I spoke about earlier, he was traveling all through Africa as well, but on, on more uh, more of a personal capacity, and uh, in the ser in, in serving the idea of broadening the horizons of understanding and knowledge. Education was extremely important to Martin uh, Delaney as well, leading African American philosopher and scholar, historian, and uh, in a way, an intellectual forefather of Alan Allen's work. But Allen's were said, since the Buffalo Soldiers, they traveled all throughout the American West, and many of them didn't have a home to go back to. They didn't, a lot of them didn't want to go back to the American South, where they were still dealing with uh, massive discrimination and oppression due to the black codes, the Jim Crow laws, even in, uh, you know, other, other states outside of the South, they were still unofficially facing very real discrimination and hardship and seeing their work undermined. So what he saw here at Allen's was an opportunity where uh, the men that he led, his comrades in arms, the Buffalo Soldiers, they could come, they could they could enjoy a genteel retirement, they could raise families, they could take up farming, they could start their own businesses. And many African Americans, not just Buffalo Soldiers, wound up coming here to Allensworth to partake in this dream that Allensworth had. And you can see uh, representations of the architecture that you'll see here at Allensworth. These are all various drawings that I've done since I arrived here last spring. But this is the schoolhouse that I'm standing in right now. 
And it uh, really was the chief cornerstone of the community, it was the center of the town. It was, uh, it was served first through eighth grade. Of course, the, uh, Colonel Allensworth had a much uh, grander vision for what the educational program here in the town would have been. But this, this was really the pride and joy of the community. And they had, uh, well, not just, uh, not just classes or educational instruction, they also had theatrical uh, uh, productions. They had uh, musical concerts of various types. I want to show you real quickly uh, what the schoolhouse looks like. So I've been standing over by the colonel's portrait this entire presentation. But this is basically, this is what a schoolhouse, Western Woodstick style construction would have looked like going back to the year 1912. And the school was in operation until 1972. So 60 years of educational instruction here at Allen's really just a beautiful building. And if you looked up the Freedmen's Bureau on the uh, National uh, Archives website, you'll see uh, schematics, drawings of what their schoolhouses look like in the years immediately following the Civil War. A lot of those drawings remind me very much of the school here, although, of course, I think they had more resources here at the school. Much more beautiful and, and permanent building. As I said, this building is one of the original structures here at Allen's. Most of the buildings, including some of the buildings I'm going to show as we advance in the presentation, most of them are total reconstructions. This one's an original. Some work's been done to basically strengthen the building and you know be in compliance with modern regulations. But the entire idea of a historic district is allowing people to step back in time and see what things were like in generations past. And that's uh, basically what we have going here. But I want to show share with you a few more images of what the town looks like. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Uh, C on the screen. Okay, it says I'm share screen. Excellent. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. You see the church here. This is a very religious community. Uh, Allensworth himself had been a chaplain and a Baptist minister. He was a, he was a very pious man. And there were three uh, religious congregations that originally gathered here at Allensworth. You have the Baptist Church, you have AME, Zion, and Seventh Day Adventists, and they all met inside of the same building. But it's really a beautiful building. If you ever, if you ever come out here to Allensworth, I, I say it's actually the most unique specimen of architecture here. There's a lot of beautiful buildings, but uh, but this one in particular stands out to me. They call it craftsman style architecture, arts and crafts. Of course, you have the Colonel himself, and this is an illustration based on that newspaper. Um, uh, illustration I showed earlier, which shows the idea that's central to the Colonel's mind the educational facility at the center. Everything emanates, everything comes out of the college that he wanted to build in the center. And this would be a college where African-Americans could come to learn farming, agriculture, horticulture. They could learn city planning, civil engineering, architecture. That was a key part of his vision. And that was even part of the educational curriculum for the elementary school here. They did a lot of drawing out here at Allensburg. And... Um, there's still a school in operation in the township of Allensworth, which is a little bit up the road, but it's uh, it's a more modern facility with, uh, you know, it's more of a modern classroom, like probably like some of the classrooms that you're sitting in today. But uh, unfortunately, this aspect of the colonel's vision was never realized as he was traveling throughout the state, uh, trying to advocate for the school and uh, advocate, you know, basically advertise the community, get more people to move here to Allensworth. So he was getting off of a trolley car, as I understand. He was hit by a speeding motorcyclist, which uh, knocked over the colonel, and he sustained a serious head injury and died as a result of that wound. The, uh, the men who were riding the motorcycle, they stayed on scene, and, but they were not charged with manslaughter. There was an inquest, but they decided not to, the courts decided not to go to trial. So here at Allensburg, there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of questions about the colonel's death. Because here, here's a man who had a tremendous vision for, the, for his people. And due to his ambitions, and due, due to his vision, uh, he, he, he certainly had political opposition and he had enemies. So a lot of people have questions uh, about his death. But either way, his death was, uh, was a serious blow to the community here. And uh, basically, uh, with his death, the, momentum, the political momentum to forming the college basically came to a standstill and the college was never realized. It was actually voted down by the state legislature almost a year after the Colonel's death in 1915. Here you have an illustration. They also had a library 
very important. Education was key, a chief cornerstone of the community here. All forms of different education. But that's why a lot of people came here. Uh, especially the African-American community moving west. Um, the Blacktown movement. Allensworth was also very involved with the Freemasons, who were major players and establishing black towns all throughout the, uh, the American West. Uh, Allensworth being the most prominent here in California. But they had a lot of different types of businesses and institutions here. They had a number of grocery stores. They had uh, a general store. And this building, believe it or not, was in operation until 1950, uh, founded by one of the pioneers of the community, Zebedee Heinzman. And he lived and operated this uh, in this town and uh, ran this grocery store until 1950. And they had a barber shop. This is an illustration I've done of the barber's chair at the Frank Milner Barber Shop, which is another very important center for the community. They had a hotel here. And believe it or not, if you were getting off of the train line in 1910, you could stay at a room in a hotel here, at the Allensworth Hotel, for 75 cents. Let's think about that. I mean, that's, any of the hotel rooms in the surrounding towns, I guarantee it's uh, at least $100, probably more just to stay there. And you can see another vision, basically a map of the town. The state park basically comprises the historical center of where the town is. The actual township extended into where the current town, the community of Allensworth is. And there's various uh, items of historical interest in the current township of Allensworth. But most of the, the most important buildings of Allensworth are preserved within or reconstructed within the state park. So you see the elementary school here. They had a they had Baptist church. They had a post office, bakery, the railroad ticket office, a um, number of houses, and the hotel. And going back to this bird's eye view map that I've drawn of Allensworth, it gives you a general idea of how flat the landscape is right farming fields, and there's a reason for that. This entire area had been underneath a massive lake, uh, the Great Tulare Lake, which is actually the largest lake in California and was a remnant of a much larger inland sea, Lake Corcoran, which uh, covered almost the entirety of the entire uh, California Central Valley before the last ice age. But it's uh, it's very interesting uh, landscape around here, but it should be known, should be noted that uh, 150 years ago, none of the towns that are around Allen's, and there are, there are a number of small towns around, none of them would have been possible because it would all would have been underneath a massive lake. The, uh, the Yokut people uh, populated this entire region, and they still live around it, but they, uh, they depended on the lake for their sustenance. They fished the lake. They, the lake in various areas was shallow enough that somebody could walk right through and uh, you know, travel the lake that way. But, uh, but at the end of the 19th century, due to droughts and due to the uh, diversion of uh, streams and rivers that naturally feed into the lake, the lake was, was dried up. And uh, basically, there's only a remnant of it left. But when I first arrived here in the spring, there was serious rain and flooding, massive snowfall coming in. That basically, it looked like the lake was beginning to reemerge. So that's one of the things that's uh, particularly interesting about the natural history of the area around Allensburg. So I just wanted to make note of that because uh, because yeah, you'll see that and you basically go through this region and you'll just see how flat the landscape is. Farms as far as you can see. And that plays an important role in the state and in the nation at large is uh, food supply, but it's also uh, it's also interesting. There's so many so much variety of landscapes, styles, or types all throughout the state of California. But throughout the Central Valley you'll basically see this Kind of flat landscape that you'll see right here in Jones. You can see images of the Buffalo Soldiers throughout the years. You'll see on some of the Buffalo Soldier patches, we're talking about uh, the years 1866 when the 10th Cavalry Regiment is formed and 1944 when they're mustered out of service over at Camp Lockett in San Diego, the very last of the uh, Buffalo Soldier forts. But their legacy, I would argue, goes back to the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War in 1863. And the army isn't fully integrated until the 1950s. So it's nearly, I'd say somewhere, somewhere in the area between 80 and 90 years of uh, U.S. military, U.S. natural history. And the contributions of these African-American soldiers, this can't be, uh, 
understated. I mean, it's this very important era in American history that was written out of all the famous Hollywood Western movies for the most part and uh, kind of escaped popular memory and imagination for, for a long time. But their impact here in California is uh, really should be emphasized. If you're interested, if you're up in the San Francisco Bay Area, I strongly recommend visiting the Presidio of San Francisco. Right underneath Golden Gate Bridge, you will see Fort Point, which is actually, that's a Civil War era fort. So you can see what life would have been like back during the Civil War uh, to, to an extent. But they have a permanent exhibition about the Buffalo Soldiers. And it was actually at the Presidio of San Francisco that the original proposal for a California Buffalo Soldier Heritage Trail was made. There was a ranger there, uh, uh, he's retired now, Ranger Frederick Penn, who had been talking about a trail that would connect the Presidios of San Francisco and Monterey to Yosemite and Sequoia in Kings Canyon National Parks, where the Buffalo Soldiers served as early park rangers. And here you can actually see the uh, Presidio Monterey. There's some buildings there at the Presidio Monterey that the Buffalo Soldiers also built. Uh, very interesting. There's an army museum, a wooden building. If you go in there, you'll, you can definitely find out more information about the Buffalo Soldiers and their time here in California. There's another image of the Presidio San Francisco. And you can find out more about them. You can actually, when I lived on Angel Island, um, I see some people have left here. When I lived on Angel Island, I was actually staying in the house where Allensworth lived, Quarters 10. It's, uh, it's, there, there's a collection of buildings on the island that, that, that date back to the American Civil War, that date back to the 1860s. And uh, if you go to Angel Island, you can see that, and you can kind of recreate what life would have been like for the Buffalo soldiers that would have been garrisoned on that island. Looking over the Golden Gate, there's a Civil War fort that goes back to uh, 1863. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of history just here in this state spread out about related to the Civil War and related to the Buffalo Soldiers. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm very glad that you could join me today. My name's Dorian, and I, I hope to see you out here at the parks. Bye, everybody. Although, wait, wait, actually, I see there might be some questions here. I'm oh, sorry I overlooked that. One second. I'll see if I can get any questions before I know I'm running short on time here. How does this work? Come on. Oh, I see basically everybody's just signing out. All right, everybody. Hey, well, uh, really glad you could join me. Again, my name's Dorian. They call me Dorian the Historian over here, and I'm, I'm really glad that you could uh, you could join me this, uh, this afternoon. Have a nice day. Bye.